Welcome everyone to our class. This is a really important class and I'm excited to talk to you about it because it is something that is going to make everything about your classroom experience easier, but it's not an easy topic to talk about. So I hope that you are ready to dive into some deep work today as we talk about decolonizing your curriculum. You might have heard that term floating around and I'm here to talk to you today about what that really means. We're going to talk about how to define it, especially in the framework we're working in as world language teachers, because it is going to mean something especially different for us since we teach colonial languages. More on that later. And I'm going to give you a few ideas for how you can get this train rolling. This is definitely a journey. It is not something that's going to be achieved in this teeny tiny class that we're going to start today. But what I hope that you accomplish and what I hope you feel by the end of this class is you feel empowered to take some beginning steps that you feel ready to maybe even talk to others about, hey, these are some important steps that we should be taking in our curriculum journey. As you are making some crucial decisions right now, you are either maybe, let me know in the comments below which step you're at right now. Maybe you are wrapping up a very difficult year and you are trying to figure out how to make your curriculum reach more students next year in a way that's more effective. Or maybe you're in the position of you are still crazy busy teaching right now and this is something you're going to put on the back burner for the summer and you might be watching this in the summer and that's cool. Let us know if you are on that replay life. If you are new to these parts of town, my name is Devin and I am the teacher author behind La Libre Language Learning if you teach Spanish or La Libre Language Learning if you teach French. And behind me, I'm excited to introduce you to somebody. This is my, oh, he's hiding, but this is my lovely assistant, Blast Off Battlefish, a new addition to our family. And he's going to be hanging out with us today. Isn't he cute? Look at him. Can you see him? Not that much, but don't worry. He's in there. He's making sure that we're doing a good job. So give him a huge welcome. And we are so glad to be joining you. Also joining the party is my new shade. What do you think? Do you like it? If you are, have you been around this part for a little bit, then maybe you know that I like to change the color of my hair. I was pink for a while and then I decided to go purple. So I'm deciding which one I like better right now. I kind of like the punk rock vibe of this one. So let me know which one you like better. But without further ado, let's jump right into what we got going on today. I am going to get to what we need to get to and share my screen so that we can start talking about and defining decolonizing your curriculum. And Blast Off Battlefish is going to make sure that we are doing a good job by supervising all of this. Could you also in the comments let me know if you can see and hear everything. And for everybody who signed up for this event, thank you so much and I appreciate your patience getting started. I actually had a knock on my door right before class started, life and had to answer a delivery. So I wanted to make sure that my very loud dog, my other assistant, didn't interrupt class. So thank you for your patience, I appreciate it. And if you are watching live, make sure to let me know, where are you teaching from? Where do you hail from? Thanks for joining us. And how's your week going? Is it good? Are you, what point are you in teaching right now? Are you still in the classroom? rolling out that June, trying to survive, or are you done? And are you getting prepared for maybe getting some of your curriculum stuff ready for next year? Let us know where you're at. And before we get started, I'm gonna, like started, started, I'm gonna check real quick and make sure that we got all of our tech duckies in a row. Let's see, let's see. Thanks for your patience. Let's see how it's going. Okay. Let me know if you can see everything. Hmm. I'm checking, I'm checking, I'm checking. Oh, 
right, there it is. Okay, great. Thanks for your patience on that, y'all. I want to make sure that we got everything rolling smoothly. Okay, so we are in, as you saw, we are in our curriculum series. And this is, <laughs> it's been a long time coming. This is class number 12, one of many. I decided to do a spring curriculum series thinking that it would be a great idea to deep dive on each individual topic, each of the pieces that help to make your curriculum really strong so that we could give each topic the attention that it deserves. Now, I will tell you that today, since we're talking about a large topic, we are really only going to skim the surface of decolonizing your curriculum. Today, we're gonna to define it and talk about one way that you can start, one action step for how you can start. This is very much an intro lesson because, I'm gonna skip this stuff for a second because we already talked about who I am and what I do. Um, and also make sure that you come and hang out with me every Wednesday because I always do a live class on Wednesdays, same place. But this is just the introduction. I will be doing a full comprehensive presentation workshop style on this topic with very concrete steps that you can take in order to progress your curriculum in the right direction. And I will say that there's no real such thing as having like a fully decolonized curriculum. That's not really a thing, but it is definitely a direction that you can go. So what we are working towards here is today we're gonna get our toes wet a little bit in the water and introduce the idea, figure out what it means and why it's important so that we know we've got our feet firmly on the ground and we know which path we should take in order to make sure that our curriculums are going in the right direction. But there's going to be a full workshop style presentation at the free conference that I'm hosting. This is round two of Practical and Comprehensible. This time around, it's going to be July 19th through the 21st. So make sure you save the date for that. And to register for free, you can go to this website right here, lalibrelanguagelearning.com forward slash register. I'm gonna be presenting on French teachers, how we can start doing this, and Spanish teachers, how we can start doing this. So today, today's a little taste, today's the introduction, and then we're gonna really dig deep into this topic at the conference. So let's get started with our intention and an action plan. Now here it says, what are you gonna do this week? But I also want to make sure that we reserve that idea for, if you're watching this in the summer, many people during this curriculum series have said, I'm saving this for the summer so that I can work on my curriculum during the summer. Great, that's an awesome idea. What are you gonna do one step from this video, wherever it seems to work best for you, what's one thing that you can do with the time that we are sharing here together? Think in your head about one thing that you want to make happen after watching this video. Because too often, what we do as teachers who are addicted to PD, I know you are, that's why you're here. I know I am, that's why I create it. And that's why I consumed so much of it when I was still in the classroom, is that we love to learn. We love to take notes. And that what ends up happening is that we, of course, get caught up in all of the demands of real life and those things get put on the shelf and we don't really see those notes anymore. So an easy way to make sure that things get rolled into action is pick one thing that you think that you could do, something that feels actionable for you. So let's start first with the definition. Decolonize, what does that really mean? Because there are many different contexts in which this word gets used. Decolonizing is of course the actual physical act of relocating and leaving a place that has previously been colonized. But what does it mean in our modern, very much so living in the legacy of colonization modern world? It is a thought process and a mindset shift where we intentionally think about things in a different perspective from the way that most of us were raised. So it's very, very difficult to do this. That's why I say it's definitely a journey. Here is the main part of it. Like very, very simplified, very boiled down. Western thinking is neither the only way nor is it the best way. And that sounds really simple when we say that in just that simple sentence, but 
what I'm really here to do today is not present myself as an expert on this topic because I'm really not. But what I have for you is an organized way that you can learn what this definition is. So I'm sharing with you the same research that I have done in order to do this work myself. So let's start with the experts here. This resource for what does decolonizing really mean in our modern context? It, and this is from a website um, from the University of BC in Canada. And oh, I forgot to mention something really important. So I put in the event here, and I can also, I'm gonna put it in the comments below at the end of class as well. I'm not gonna be able to do it right now, but to make sure that you get my full attention. But all of these links that you're gonna see, there's about four or five different articles that we're gonna talk about today and a book. What you will see here, they're all nicely lined up for you in a blog post. So go to the blog post and you'll be able to find all of those in here. If you go to the event where this is being streamed right now on Facebook, or you might be watching this later on YouTube, that will be linked right below here. You'll see the blog article on my website where all this stuff is linked. But let's look here, now that we got that out of the way, let's look here at what this quote really is to help us contextualize this idea. Decolonization, as what we're searching to do here, this is one perspective out of many of what it means for us. It's the process of deconstructing colonial ideologies of the superiority and privilege of Western thought and approaches. So if you look back here at this, the idea that it's neither the only way nor the best way. On the one hand, decolonization involves dismantling structures that perpetuate the status quo, addressing unbalanced power dynamics. We're probably all pretty familiar with that idea in, our, in the modern times that we are living in, but something else that we need to make sure that is part of this as well is on the other hand, decolonization involves valuing and revitalizing indigenous knowledge and approaches, as well as weeding out settler biases or assumptions that have impacted indigenous ways of being. So you've probably picked up by now that this is the indigenous perspective on what decolonization means for us and our thought processes and how much disentanglement we have to do with the idea that Western state of mind, Western state of being is the better way as well as the only way because that was definitely an act of suppression during decolonization, um, during colonization, I should say. Colonization is certainly not just an act of claiming a territory, it is certainly suppressing a people and suppressing mindsets. So what we are trying to do with the materials in our curriculum is start to dismantle the processes, the mindsets, the systems, as well as the beliefs. It's much more intangible. And this is something especially crucial for teachers. For non-Indigenous people, decolonization is the process of self-examination, examining beliefs about Indigenous peoples and culture by learning about yourself in relationship to the communities where you live and the people with whom you interact. So we are gonna step away from this for a second so that you can see the full article here. I've got a couple of them pulled up. So let me make sure that it's the, the right one here. Yep, this is it, okay. So this is from BC campus here and it's a guide, a guide for frontline staff, student services and advisors, understanding decolonization, indigenization and reconciliation. Now, I got, this is right here, this first paragraph, so that we could see it large and in charge. And some of the things that we're gonna be looking at today is how the indigenous perspective contributes to the overall viewpoint of decolonization because there are also many different perspectives that we're gonna look at today. We're gonna to look at from the, gener the general education perspective, what it means to be an educator in a colonial system because education is of course, both a byproduct of a colonial system as well as something that fights against it. And we're also gonna look at it from the point of view view of Pan-African peoples and the diaspora and what that means in that sense of decolonization. 
But the most important thing I think to look at here is this part at the end. I thought this was really especially poignant is that, uh, and it might be very small here, but again, you can go to this link later on and read this whole thing for yourself that indigenization, which is the idea, the collaborative process of naturalizing, respecting and uplifting indigenous content processes and ways of being that of course, that's a summary. Make sure that you read the whole thing here. That indigenization is not an indigenous issue and it's not undertaken solely to benefit indigenous students. This is something that uplifts all peoples. Indigenous indigenization benefits everyone. We gain a richer understanding of the world and of our specific location in the world through awareness of indigenous knowledge and perspectives. The same idea, of course, that truth rules out, that there's never just one experience of history. And of course, that the suppression of history and the suppression of one people means the suppression of all people. Let's look at another definition from a different perspective. And so when you, like I did, if you are googly googling on the internet to find things about decolonizing your curriculum, you will find that many of the articles and resources are very academic in nature, like this one. Not a bad thing, just is. So what I wanna look at next is an article from an activist and a member of the youth community with the people who you, of course, are probably interacting with and what it means to her. So we're going to take a look at this from a very personal perspective next. This is an article by Tina Curiel Allen. So let's take a look at this one. Okay. This is called What Decolonization Is and What It Means to Me. This article, I think when you read this here, you will definitely see that it's a very different way of seeing the world than is normally portrayed in mainstream media, I guess you could say. So let's just read the first section here together. To talk about decolonization, people need an understanding of what we are decolonizing from. Colonization is when a dominant group or system takes over and exploits and extracts from the land and its native peoples. Colonization has taken place all over the globe through the stealing of lands, the raping of women, the taking of slaves, the breaking of bodies through fighting, labor, imprisonment, and genocide, the stealing of children, the enforcement of religion, the destruction or attempts to destroy spiritual ways of life. All of these things have left a psychological, spiritual, and physical imprint on indigenous peoples and a governmental ruling system that we did not create that was not made for us. These are things that we need to heal from where we need to start reclaiming. This is where organizing and decolonizing comes in. How do those who have been colonized go about decolonizing? It is in the interest of the colonizer to divide and conquer, to separate us from community. So speaking from a place of we is necessary when talking about it. It is as political and communal as it is personal. And then she goes on to talk about different ways that this is possible. The elders say we decolonize through our bodies and our values, which quite literally means through the senses. Scent, remember, drum and song a life rhythm that can be easily drowned out in the business of American life. They bring us back home to ourselves and the interconnectedness of all things. We put our hands on the earth and pray to honor the mother who never leaves us. We communicate by how we dress through feathers, fabrics, jewelry, and other things. We also try to view the world and one another differently to honor the sacred in all of us. So this is one person's perspective on what it means to be or to work through decolonization and decolonizing. And I thought that this was especially powerful just because it is, well, obviously she's an incredible writer, she's a poet, but also that it is, it's very like gut punching, it's very visceral. It pulls zero punches about the legacy, the legacy. So take a look at this and read the full thing. And I think that you'll find well, or I, I guess I shouldn't put my experience on you, but reading this is very unsettling. It's very unsettling in that 
it has a very different feel to it in what it means to be a human in America. And that unsettling feeling that you feel is a little bit of the process of dismantling the way that you think that that understanding that there are multiple perspectives and also that the perspective that is dominant has of course the possibility to be deeply harmful to others especially when it's considered the only one that is definitely what i experienced while reading this you might experience something different the next one we're going to look at is very helpful this article is, of course, specifically for educators because it's called Decolonizing the Classroom. And I'm not going to go back to presentation because we'll, we're just going to jump into another article here anyways. But this article is huge. It has a lot of robust ideas for you. So we're just going to take a look at a few here so that you can see and start to look at some of these definitions and some ideas of how we can start this work. Okay. So this is from NCTE, the National Council of Teachers of English. And we're gonna scroll through this really quickly, but I encourage you to go through and look at this and see all of the things that are quoted in here all of the resources and people that are quoted in here. I know just reading this two times, I know I need to go back and look at a lot of this and look up a lot of these different books and resources that are mentioned here. So just scrolling this, you can see that there's a lot going on in here. We are going to focus in on this part right here. This is important. The whole idea of this article is that if you would like to decolonize your curriculum and make your classroom a safer space for all of your students, no matter what background they come from, because decolonizing your curriculum, again, is for everybody, it benefits everyone, that it actually has less to do with outside factors, such as some of the things that are listed here. And we're gonna talk about these here. In an attempt to decolonize the classroom, one can make many changes. But one of the things that he mentions the most as being the most important is truly self-awareness. How we as teachers are actually a part of this process and some of the things that we need to wrestle with as our unique roles in this colonial system. So let's take a look at this so you can see what I mean. Aha, this is interesting. Okay, so. He here is talking about English, right? Because this is the, the NCTE, but I think it's applicable, especially to us as world language teachers, since many of you who are watching teach a colonial language. I taught French and Spanish as both colonial languages. Anyone who teaches English outside of England is part of the colonial project. How does that land with you when you read that? Because to me, that feels really weird particularly if teaching takes place within a sanctioned institution, aka a school, and if the English being taught is a standardized official English, one need only contemplate the role of language and schooling in European colonization of the Americas, Africa, Australia, and Asia to grasp the central function of teaching, particularly teaching English in colonization. This is something as teachers that we need to wrestle with is the role of teaching a language and suppressing native language in order to get, for lack of a better word, an agenda across. Okay, here's another important thing to consider, especially in the age of teaching that we are in. Something that we are all wrestling with is our role in how to make the world a better place when all of us as teachers signed up for this job because that's exactly what we wanted to do. So I will let him take the reins here because I think he says it beautifully, this feeling that a lot of us experience with our weird role in the classroom. Because this is exactly what decolonization is all about, is doing some of this deep work. So you might want to read this a few times. 
a politically conscious teacher acknowledges that one cannot claim to be purely and innocently against racism while acting as a functionary for a colonial and racist system, especially when benefiting materially while doing so, receiving a paycheck. To build on Napoleon's observation, among those who dislike oppression are many who enjoy the privileges the oppressive system offers. I have been teaching for over 30 years, Michael Seward has. I have yet to encounter a teacher who openly espouses racism. Everyone claims to be against it. Everyone wants to empower students. Yet to begin to ameliorate the deep damage caused by colonization and racism or systems of power means to be actively and overtly political. To decolonize the classroom, one must examine oneself and one's beliefs. This is important. And this is some stuff that, of course, is going to take some time to wrestle with and figure out what this really means for you. You can read a few of these here. I would definitely recommend that you give some deep thought into some of the things that are pointed out here. I think that these are the ones that stand out the most to me. So I'm gonna read out these ones, but of course, different ones are gonna stand out to you. Learn to live in the discomfort of having to take a stand. Acknowledge that your role as teacher has been historically problematic, not the good guy. That by teaching English, or I would say our romance languages or colonial languages in this context, in this discussion, we are inherently complicit with forces that damage marginalized students. See and address the trauma that colonization, poverty, sexism, racism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression can and do cause for marginalized students. And this one, this one's for real, this one's for real. Resist seeing yourself as the good guy fighting the good fight. This has some really heavy stuff in it. And it's, I think one of the things that re wrestling with this idea and learning more about decolonization probably taught me more about teaching and my real role as a teacher, I think, than probably most other things that I've ever done when it comes to learning about teaching. This is also really poignant, the ideas of the problems behind charity, but that's definitely for another day. I told you she's very loud. Excuse my loud dog. Okay, so now that we have an idea of Starting to think of what this means, let's take a look at how we can use this knowledge to our benefit, become better teachers for it, serve our students better. So with decolonizing the classroom, another important quote that I pulled out from this article here is that to empower students or anyone on the margins means much more than guiding individuals to a sanctioned academic success. Individuals are empowered when systems are altered to shift power toward the groups to which they belong. So we as teachers naturally gravitate towards the love, care, and support of individuals, which is of course important because that's part of culturally responsive teaching as we're gonna talk about in a minute. But that to really make this happen for the whole system to come tumbling down and to be rebuilt the way that in a way that empowers all students and serves all students, that systems is really what we should be attacking and where we should place most of our emphasis. Listen, Canva, don't get sassy on me just because I rolled away from you. Okay, so now this is the point that I do something usually pretty different from many people who teach on culturally responsive topics. And I'm gonna ask you here the real question and like feel about it whatever type of way you want to, but I have a feeling this is really what you're thinking in your head. That's cool. I'm into that because obviously I'm here ready to talk about a difficult topic, 
but how do I get started? Or how do I do more than what I feel like I'm already doing? Because if you are the type of teacher that I, you probably are, if you are attending something like this, then you've probably been to a few conferences. You've probably attended some workshops and you've probably read some really difficult books to read. You've probably done some really difficult thinking and done some deep work and made a lot of really brave choices in your classroom. And so now you're wondering, that's a great idea and I'm into all that, but what I really need now are some steps. Like I know what this is and I get that it's gonna make my classroom better and that it's also going to help me reach more students and that's an important part of being a teacher. But give me the real deal. How is this gonna impact my curriculum? because it's not gonna happen if we don't have some real steps, right? It's quite one thing to learn what the definition is and it's quite another to figure out how we're gonna make it happen. So let's start with a few answers now. So here's some of my answers here. And this is of course from the first resource that we saw um, from the University of BC. For something to remember about this is that for non-Indigenous people, decolonization is really the process of examining your beliefs about indigenous peoples and culture by learning about yourself in relationship to the communities where you live and the people with whom you interact. So what that really means in three words is learn about, four, four words, learn about indigenous communities. Figure out what is in your area, what is in your country and what stories have been neglected or not told at all in your classroom and start to include them. But first, that means that you need to know more about what you're talking about. And that is something that we can we could all really afford to do because there is so much out there to learn that has not really been told. My answer, I would say, like from my perspective, like not being an expert, but my answer, I would say, is that for somebody who teaches a colonial language that has a lot of baggage around being a colonial language, both of them, Spanish and French, is for us, for Spanish and French teachers, our responsibility here is we could do some good work examining our relationship with and portrayal of damaging colonial systems and legacies in Francophone and Hispanic countries. So what do I mean by that? I mean the over glorification that French teachers often do of French culture and the often I would say neglect of or omission of other stories in the, the whole Francophone world. So my entire career learning French from when I was 10 to now as a 28 year old, I had to fight and struggle in order to get Francophone voices at all. Like my, my college, even though it was a really robust French program, didn't really offer a lot of Francophone stuff. And as a student in going through like French classes, there was just like Eiffel Towers everywhere. And it was mostly about France, even though in my own personal experience, I've only met one or two French people. Like most of the people that I've talked to in French have been from all other places, like Haiti and Canada and like all kinds of other places, Martinique, but France is not really, and of course, like, as many activists would say that the, to fully appreciate a culture doesn't mean that you would ever suppress or put down somebody else's culture. It's not that, but that what the point I'm trying to make very clumsily is we as French teachers would do well to examine our relationship with the, the glorification that we put into everything about French culture, which is a beautiful culture, but there's also a lot of dark sides to it. There's also a lot of stories to it that we should also be telling. And there's a whole other world out there of Francophone stories that need to be told, need to be told. And the same thing really exists with 
Spanish teachers as well. But as a French teacher, I feel like that needs to be said. So let's go with two outcomes today. This is from the article that we were just looking at. I took a screenshot of this so that we could look at this with some intent here. My outcome for you as we watch this class is that you can start to become conscious of what decolonization means and start that process. Or if you've already started, maybe go a few more steps in that process of self-awareness, of realizing the dominant narratives that are around us every day, the dominant narratives that are present, presented in your textbook and the materials all around you, and how we can start to maybe pull those pieces apart a little bit. And the very first step I told you at the beginning of this class that I would give you one concrete action that you could do. And this is my idea for you. We're gonna look at, if you look at this bullet list over here, in an attempt to decolonize a classroom, one can make many changes that he suggests here. Of course, I suggest like go read the whole article, see all the goods that are in there. It's not that long. It took me about maybe, I don't know, six or eight minutes to read something like that. And then it'll take you some more time to digest. but these are just some great action steps to look at here for the purpose of our class today. You can diversify materials and content. So we're going to start with that one today. Teach to learning outcomes that address power and social justice. If you need help with that, I have a library of resources for you and two of them are free. So come check those out. Design assessments that allow diverse students to demonstrate mastery in diverse ways. So cool. Involve students in the creation of knowledge, content, and curriculum. I would argue that that is one of the central principles of proficiency and CI methods in general. Embrace diverse language usage in interactions, writing, and tests. Cool. We already do that. We can always do better, though. And involve oneself at the institutional, local, state, and national levels to advocate for equity. But the first change must be to become politically conscious and to figure out what's really going on here and the truth behind the profoundly damaging legacy of colonization. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and start looking at this magical resource right here. This is a pretty, I wouldn't say it's a dense read because it's very well written, but it's got so much in here. Look at all these but this is Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. And in the blog post that is linked here underneath this event, there's a link to this book if you would like to buy it or if you'd like to send it to your admins to buy for your department. I recommend going that route. Do not spend your own money if you do not have to. Ask, they would probably buy this for you. This book set me back, I think it was either, I think it was 35 or $40, I'm trying to remember. I don't remember exactly, I think it was $40. But the link that I'm going to have for you is an affiliate link, which means that I'll get a tiny piece of the purchase at no cost to you for promoting it. And it is also from bookshop.org, which is an awesome company. They support independent bookshops and all of the purchases from their books also go to support independent bookshops, which is rad, but if the shipping takes too long for you, you can also get it on Amazon, no problem. Do whatever works best for you. Also, I'm sure that you could find this at a library or something along those lines. But to make sure that you know the full gist on that, I have a link for you that you can get that book. So we're gonna take a look at page 16 real quick of Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain by Zaretta Hammond. She speaks so much to my soul here with this quote. Beyond knowing the brain science, the biggest challenge I see teachers struggling with, I bet you you can relate to this, is how to operationalize culturally responsive pedagogical principles into the actual practices. Yes, yes, got my hand raised right here. It means understanding the basic concepts of culturally responsive pedagogy and then learning the instructional moves associated with them. So I wanted to start with this quote because what we talked about here AKA the worldview presented in your room is something that Zaretta gives us a really good idea and grasp for why this is important and how we can decolonize 
everything that we're doing, but especially our curriculums and the worldview that we're presenting in our classroom through culturally responsive framework. It's called the Ready for Rigor framework, and she presents it on page 18 here. And it's definitely more in depth than this. I'm giving you like a teeny tiny snippet of all this, but there are four practice areas of culturally responsive teaching that she outlines in this. The first one is awareness, which is some of what we've done today. Most of our class today was about awareness, figuring out where teaching lies in the socio-political context and helping to make that initial switch, which is hard but necessary, that teachers are not necessarily the good guys, that we actually are both promoters of an oppressive colonial legacy as well as fighters against it and that we are caught somewhere in between. And so we can kind of decide which way we go in that, but that we do have a complicit role in that. And we can do some things about it, but it's important to have that awareness first. And also that power is divided along racial lines in our world. That is a fact of how we live today and something that we need to actively work against. Number two is learning partnerships. And that is exactly what it sounds like on the surface level, although there are many pieces to it that she outlines, but it mainly has to do with relationships, how to build relationships and in ways that are responsive to every type of student that will walk through your room. The third is information processing, which is where she gets into all of the neuroscience, the impact of one's culture on it and how we can utilize our natural, what's the word I'm looking for? Our natural attraction to connection when it comes to teaching, our need for connection in order to learn. And the last one is really relevant to what we're talking about today, which is community building creating an environment for learning, which is essential to culturally responsive teaching. And there's a lot of different aspects of this. It has to do with, she talks a lot about the routines in place, the procedures in place, but she also talks about the environment that we set up in just the physical space. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today because that is a good first step that we can make. And just as a little side note, this is something that I talked about a little bit earlier in another class that, the, the legacy method of teaching, presentational and practice mode, it's really not compatible with this framework. Um, and proficiency is, according to this framework, really, I would argue it's the most culturally responsive world language teaching method that I've really seen so far. If you can think of another one, let us know, because that's where we would all like to be. Okay, so this is the last thing that's really going to bring it home for us. Number four, community building. So I told you she talks about this on page 18. Let me go back to it so we can look at it. Like there's like a whole beautiful little framework here. And community of learners and learning environment is right in there. I got a fancy new webcam, so now I can focus on things. So exciting. Okay, so she says here, we focus as teachers on creating an environment that feels socially and intellectually safe for dependent learners to stretch themselves and take risks. Now, dependent learners is something that she talks about extensively in her book. Check it out to figure out exactly what that is. I don't wanna mess up the definition for you here. Too often, we think of the physical setup of our classroom. This is mind blowing when I read this. Physical setup of our classroom as being culturally neutral. When in reality, it's often an extension of the teacher's worldview and the dominant culture the culturally responsive teacher tries to create an environment that communicates care, support, and belonging in ways that students recognize. This was really eye-opening for me and something that has, since I read it, shaped the way that I designed my learning environment. And I hope that it can help with yours too. And this is part of the awareness factor of realizing that our mere presence in the classroom and the design choices that we make, even in something as simple as decoration, as well as, of course, all of the policies and procedures and routines that we have, they all say something about what we perceive to be the dominant culture, what we perceive to be our world view. So how does that sit with you reading that? 
Now comes the action phase. So put in the comments, whether you're watching this live or you're gonna watch this later. Hello, Replay Florence, thanks for joining us. Put in the comments from what you learned today based on just your room and the way that it's set up. Think about everything in there. The way that the seats face each other. Well, you know what? Let's not even go there because you have zero control over that right now. That was, that's, sorry, that's pre-COVID Devin thinking about my seating arrangements. Don't even, I'm so sorry about that. This, you can see here that I have not been in the classroom this year and don't know your struggles. So don't even worry about that. But let's jump to something that is definitely relevant that you do have control over. So release that right now. But another thing that you do have control over might be what is on your walls? What posters are there? Who was highlighted as being a star? What places have you been to as a world language teacher when you promote travel? What places do you talk about? What places have you been to? What does your room say based on the way it's set up, the things that are in there, and the cultures that are represented, as well as the people that are represented, and the types of messages that are on your posters. Now, I'm even thinking of, you know, those encouraging posters that a lot of us have about like turning in homework on time and always uh, trying your best and being prepared for class. Like think about actually a lot of the implicit messages that are inside all of those beliefs about what it means to be an academically prepared student, because those definitely have embedded messages in them about the dominant culture and what it means to be a good student, uh, especially things like be quiet and raise your hand. That's something that gets talked about extensively in this book about culturally responsive teaching. So I'm not here to give you answers about what your room says about you or what posters to choose, but I am here to tell you what mine was and maybe what could be an example for you. For me, I made a very conscious choice to not put up anything about France because I knew that they would, or I put like one thing up there about France, because I knew that I had like a whole travel diary about going to France, but that I had plenty more to say about other places that I had been and that hello and that french class primarily is not about france and that there is a whole world of people that speaks french and that there is a lot to be learned about it oh, you want to come say hi to the fish i told everybody about our assistant hey this is eric hey where are you hiding he's hiding back there Ooh, don't he's... scare him jeez hi buddy is that mommy fish or me so put in the comments below, what do you think is going to be your message that you have? What is the worldview that you are presenting based on just what is in your room and the way that it's set up? This also means like what's on your bookshelf. And these are all ideas to get you started on what's going to be a long journey. Okay, so now I have for you, what's next? If you liked this, even though it was uncomfortable, because like, guess what? This type of stuff is uncomfortable, I get it. It's just one of those things where you just, you just gotta put on those itchy britches and just sit in it and be ready to deal with it. But I really appreciate your time being here today and learning with me about something that is definitely not an easy topic. But if you learned something today and you're ready to dive in and really get started on this and take a bite out of it, join me at our conference here, July 19th through 21st. It is a free conference to all for all of the days that the presentations go live. And if you would like lifetime access, then of course you can upgrade to get that too. And I accept all kinds of purchase orders too. So make sure that you talk to your department about it now. But join me so that you can get a full guide depending on what language you teach. I'm gonna be doing two presentations, one for Spanish and one for French to help you start your decolonization journey with specific resources, things you could talk about, ideas for your level one and level two curriculum so that this doesn't feel as hard as it needs to be. All articles and resources are linked on the blog article that I've put in here. So you should be set 
with all the things that you need in order to be successful. Oh, and I see on here, oh, look who it is, Stephanie, somebody else that you're going to see at the conference. My walls are covered with words. And you know what that says to your students? That they have tons of resources to support them, that they are welcome there and that looking for help is encouraged. What an empowering message. That is a great idea. That's a great idea. I love that. So again, make sure that you save the date and come and join us for this free conference where you're gonna learn a lot more about this and take some really meaningful steps toward everything that we talked about today. LaLibreLanguageLearning.com forward slash register. I hope to see you there. Let's close this on out with a bunch of gratitude. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate your time and I hope to see you at the conference July 19th through the 21st. Say bye, beta. Bye.